Cool. Well, it looks like Boris is trying to connect, so we will get the next. Oh, look at that. How Hello, you doing, everybody. Boris? I'm yeah. good. How are you? Do doing, doing awesome. Doing awesome. Well, it's great to have you here. And uh, and yeah, it looks like we're all, uh, everything's working. You, you want to see if your slides are... Yes, certainly would get, like to. get the slides going. Yeah, sweet. Right on. Well, while you're uh, getting that all started, uh, we're excited to learn about the pillars of successful API governance uh, from Boris today. So it uh, should be interesting to learn about all this stuff. Uh, could you let me know which screen are you seeing right now? Is it seeing the full screen presentation uh, or? Uh, right now, I'm actually not seeing any screen yet. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's unfortunate. I okay, so yeah, just bear with us for just a second. Okay, I have some security issues. Just bear with me. So no, uh, no worries. That's why we started a minute early. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely a new world with virtual conferences, but uh, it's great that, that this stuff is out there so we can all get this content, no matter where we are, no matter if we're stuck inside or not. Oh, looks like we got some slides coming. Okay, so what do you, what do you see now? The full full on screen slides or slides with the, the yeah, timeline? Yeah, I, I see the full the, the 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 full presentation. Yeah, so it looks like we're good. All right, thank you very much, and with your permission, I'll get started. Yeah, take it away. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody to the pillars of the successful API governance session. My name is Boris Verinov. I work for ADP Automatic Data Processing as a part of the enterprise architecture team responsible for the API governance across the entire organization. API governance has become a very popular topic as compared to just a few years ago. And it's great that the API Day is dedicating the entire track to the API governance. Nowadays, many organizations going through the digital transformation process recognize that APIs are the foundation of any digital transformation. However, one big question still remains for many large companies. How to ensure the API consistency across the enterprise, reduce the development costs, increase the API adoption rate while expanding the scope of business operations offered through APIs. This session is focused on the main principles of the successful API governance based on the real life experiences by ADP. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with ADP as a company because you're receiving paychecks with ADP logo on it. But ADP is more than just a payroll processing. Uh, it has representations in many countries around the world serving nearly three quarter of a million clients worldwide and offers a uh, wide variety of different human capital and payroll uh, solution. Um, but the main strength of ADP is data. As we typically joke, data is our middle name. And ADP products cover all areas of the workforce management from job search and recruiting all the way to retirement. And having all these uh, different domains, uh, products serving different domains, uh, APIs have become a central connection of all these products. Essentially, it becomes a central nervous system of the company. I would like to continue with one of the quotes by Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO. Every company is a software company. Every company is a digital organization. And this could not be more true for ADP. ADP has started many years ago as a service company. And the general per perception uh, was that ADP is a very conservative, very old fashioned company. But over the past few years, uh, ADP started starting as a service company, uh, has transformed actually in a software company providing services. And that's, uh, would, uh, I would categorize as a great success. Uh, as a software company, ADP grew through acquisitions, often acquiring, acquiring small and medium-sized companies, often with the product and its own customer base. Uh, as a result, it includes a variety of products, a variety of platforms and technologies, and it becomes difficult to integrate multiple across multiple products. So the APIs naturally came to the rescue. API is everything. That's the motto. 
Uh, ADP has started on the on its journey, probably uh, API journey, probably slightly more than ten years ago, and it started initially with the data synchronizations for the products that were acquired. Uh, then our next initiative was ADP going mobile, where the mobile solution was offered and became very popular. And actually, I'm very proud to be a part of this initiative. Uh, the entire uh, time span from the inception to the first production release was nine months. And I think it's a very gr great and aggressive schedule. Our uh, next step was marketplace. Uh, the mar ADP has quickly realized that it's, uh, there is another niche uh, that can be serviced uh, so the data and ADP expertise can be actually not sold directly to the customers, but through the network of partners uh, who would serve their own customers using uh, ADP engines, ADP data, ADP knowledge, ADP experience. So the APIs have become uh, marketplaceable. And uh, lastly, all products within ADP are going currently through digital transformation, exposing their functionality through APIs. And those APIs are getting credit to be exposed to the marketplace. Um, I keep saying APIs, APIs, and everybody has its own definition of the API. But what is an ideal API? And obviously, there are different uh, perceptions, different solutions, and there is no single definition, but let me try. So a, a good API is built by developers for developers. Uh, it's convenient and flexible mechanism to ex exchange data. It's intuitive to use. It's simple, useful, discoverable, and predictable, and offers precise and customizable request response. Uh, it's also easy to access. So it uses straightforward security model, uh, hopefully somewhere behind the scene. And obviously, it's uh, available around the clock. So we will always want to have it available. But let's do some reality check. Uh, data is not just an asset, but it's also a liability. We all know how important data is, how often data breaches are uh, happening, breaches happening today, and how important to protect your data. This conference is taking place in New York, or at least the physical presence was supposed to be in New York. And the main topic of the conference is banking, finance, insurance, and APIs in all these industries. Guess what? All these industries are very heavily regulated. So we need to make sure that APIs are driven or uh, adhering to the regulations. Uh, as I said, large enterprise have multiple backends, and the EDP growing through acquisitions is not a very unique case. Our companies are looking to minimize their expenses, which includes API maintenance costs and consumer onboarding costs, because as the consumer base grows, so they have onboarding costs. And learning curves impacts the adoption rate. Uh, so what is the answer to these uh, questions and how to solve this? API govern governance to the rescue. What is API governance? Uh, API governance is more than API management. So setting up a platform, whether it's any particular product or in-house written platform, in-house solution, is a good step towards API governance, but it's not all by far. API governance at the same time is not the same as the data governance, because uh, what API data governance more controls the data store within the products. API governance represents communication contracts, so it governs the inter-product interaction, interactions rather than the product data itself. APIs must be secure and share a common security model. I'm not going to be talking much about securing APIs because it's a subject for, although it is a very fundamental aspect of any API governance success, uh, it's worth a separate discussion, separate session, probably more than one session. Uh, also important aspect of the governments, no one size fits all approach. There are different levels of go uh, governance. There are APIs, let's say, returning your location of your offices. That's one level of governance. Or there are APIs returning your banking information on your sensitive personal information. That's a completely different level of governance. Uh, what we do, we have identified three basic levels of governance. Uh, first level, the lowest level, is the APIs within the boundaries of a given product. Uh, the next one is the APIs still within uh, ADP ecosystem, but uh, cross-product communication, that's medium level of governance, and APIs exposed uh, through the marketplace to external consumers, that's the highest level of governance. So with that, let's talk about the pillars or components of the successful um, governance model. So the first and foremost uh, pillar or component of the governance model is the developing domain and capability model. 
Uh, I'm not talking about very specific uh, object model or very specific uh, representation. I'm mostly talking about logical model that would drive the API payloads. Uh, the business terms that are part of the domain model would drive the JSON schema components, and that would become in turn API building blocks. It's important to realize that there are different granularity levels. So some of them very primitive, some of them a little more coarse, some of them very business oriented. Uh, those components are not built in stone. Uh, they maintain our inner sourcing, so different teams can potentially suggest the changes. But important things to understand that this, those components, or, uh, those building blocks still needs to be mappable to the business terms while being contextualizable. What does contextualizable mean? Uh, it means that uh, different APIs, although it's the same business term and a different geopolitical context or different industry context, can have certain elements that are either applicable or not applicable. And while the same business term is remain unchanged, the representation through API or through the JSON scheme or through the JSON component can differ. Uh, capability model. Again, that's a topic for the whole new presentation, which is uh, I'm, I'm planning to do one of the upcoming um, conferences. Um, capability model. The capability model actually wraps around what can be done to certain elements within your um, domain model. It actually wraps up the whole processes around. And while the resources of your APIs are based on business terms, such as domain model, operations are driven by the capability model. So that's the first pillar of success. The second one is embracing API-first design approach. Uh, it's been said a lot over past few years how important API-first design approach, and I'm not here to advocate it. I'm just saying that not every team is very welcoming it. Uh, sometimes teams would like to have, uh, instead of having specification coming before implementation, would like to do implementation first and then generate specification using one of many software packages around. And that's not something that we embrace or uh, suggest. Uh, APIs using API first approach, API typically designed for longer life and backwards compatibility because some research is done up front and a, a designer has a chance to review and actually see the different use cases. It's aligned to the business capability model. Why is it important? Because there are different products and they sometimes can have overlapping functionality and within this overlapping functionality, they can have different realizations of the same features. So when the APIs are exposed, they should be mappable to those uh, internal screens, internal features, and they represent consistent look and feel. So it, that, that's why it's important to have it mapped to the business capability model. Uh, the APIs are self-descriptive, or JSON schema, open API, or any other standard. Support code generation, that's is again, as opposed to write code first and generate specifications later. Uh, despite popular opinion, it actually makes things uh, go faster because it enables uh, producer consumer parallel development. Uh, both can code to the completed specifications, unit testing using the predefined contracts. So there is no dependency on each other. As a result, uh, you see reduced development cost and reduced time to market. So it's not really, I would say, in, uh, upfront investment, it's or upfront overhead. It's more likely shifting of resources. And also, it offers reduced risk of failure because it's easier to change documentation uh, than working code. And the main thing is the specification developed as a result of API first is a contract. Uh, the next component of the successful program is ensuring API consistency. Uh, it does reduce consumer learning rate, uh, curve. Imagine if you have a partner who purchased API, a certain product from you, and this product is uh, communicated through APIs, and hopefully a consumer uh, or partner likes you and they want to purchase more services from you. And they purchase more services, and then they realize that the API model is completely different. The naming conventions are different. The object structures are different. Everything is different. So for them, it's almost like going with a different company. So Kevin KPI consistency makes your company looks professional and trustworthy. So as a result, you, you would see the increased adoption rate. Now, further on the consistency, object representations and naming conventions are derived from the governed domain model. Uh, service URIs and operations are derived from the governed capability model. Again, everything is governed, but everything is contextualizable. API specifications derived from the governed templates. So it presents consistent look and feel. As a result, in addition to increased adoption rate, you would see reduced development and maintenance cost. Uh, the next pillar of the 
uh, successful API governance program is the federated API design or use inner sourcing or within the company. So last year uh, in during the API days in San Francisco, I presented the whole session on the federated API design within ADP and outlined a lot of benefits of it. Uh, so in this uh, this time, I'm not going to go into details about just in a nutshell. Essentially, it's uh, there is a repository that includes all API specifications developed by different teams. It includes the uh, uh, templates, it includes examples, and every team can clone it or submit their changes via pull requests. Um, the main reason for the API federated API design is to avoid bottlenecks. In a large corporation, no single team, no matter how big the team is, cannot uh, follow the pace because very often the teams require API assistance uh, at the same time. So you don't want to uh, create bottlenecks. Also, no single team would have all, uh, ever have enough expertise to go across the diversified uh, portfolio of products and have expertise in every single product. So you want to use expertise from multiple sources. And also, you want to evaluate different designs by different teams, see different viewpoints. But the main uh, reason for the API, main goal of the federated API design is to scale API portfolio. This is actually a high level chart of how the federated uh, um, API design works. Essentially, it's a classic open or inner source model because it's within the same company. Uh, so the subject matter experts from different domains, different products submit their changes. Uh, they're reviewed by the API governance and become official publication. Of course, this is very oversimplified project. I mean, oversimplified view. And the main reason for this simplification, I have not gone uh, through the API uh, governance program uh, from the API governance body, which is a very essential and critical component of the successful API governance. Uh, what is the API governance organization and how we build the API governance organization? Uh, governance organization is both centralized and federated. Um, it includes the centralized center of enablement, API stewards, or sometimes called center of excellence. I think that was Gartner's suggestion going back to 2001 to have to call it center of excellence. I've seen it both ways. Uh, so it has the business unit API stewards and also includes the product subject matter experts. One of the interesting features is or flexibility of this distributed model that BU product onboarding occurs as needed. So if the product is not ready to engage with the digital transformation, they don't have to be a part of the governance organization, although it's strictly, I mean, it's highly recommended to be to represent, but it's up to the product when they decide to join. Uh, the governance organization has visibility to enterprise capabilities across different business units and across different products. So very often the products would not be aware of something already existent uh, simply because it goes outside of their boundary and that's the centralized government or shared governance organization would help a lot. Uh, one of the features that we're particularly proud of is embracing a culture of ambassadors, trusted representatives. So essentially it's a trainer trainer approach. Uh, it's very difficult to have train to train um, multiple scrum development teams across a large organization. And what we do, we work with the business unit leadership to have the designated senior level architects uh, who would actually be trained in all the aspects of the governance, all the aspects of the API development. They would know uh, what are the standards, what are the expectations, what are the templates, what are the tools available to help them. And in turn, they would kind of uh, train their own teams and uh, having the uh, deep business knowledge of their product, having or knowing all the nuances of their product, it would be much more easier to communicate with the development team rather than the centralized organization, which would be communicating often in abstract terms, and that would uh, make the communication much harder. Um, Provides the governance organization provide guidance to development teams and maintains documentation and tutorial, publishes, maintains specifications, and seeks the executive sponsorship. Very important, last but not least. Uh, no matter how good your organization, how uh, governance uh, structure is, sometimes a little push from the executives is needed uh, just to make sure that the, the value is recognized and the direction is set by the top management to follow the rules. Um, this chart kind of represents a very high level of um, the governance process. And again, there is a, a big distinction between governance and guidance. 
what we're trying to do, we're trying to maintain as much guidance as possible and as little governance as possible. And it very much depends on the experience of the teams that worked with us before. And uh, the more experienced the teams, the more guidance, less governance are required. Uh, so basically, that's what it is. It's the product owner would submit the integration, uh, would submit the integration request to the uh, business unit architect. The uni business unit architect would in turn uh, consult with the business unit API stewards, who would seek cons uh, guidance from the COE API stewards, who would in turn check with the product SMEs as well as the BU. Um, API steward. So when they submit their review back to the product architect, product architect take it into consideration and submit the final uh, design for the review to the centralized government body, which would again consult with product SMEs uh, if needed with the business union stewards and uh, make this uh, specification, uh, accept the specification change and make it available. Uh, last but not least, communication and marketing. There is, you know, there are many sayings, uh, wisdoms uh, on this topic, like uh, if you're not in Google, you don't exist. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is there, does it still make a sound? Well, you do want to make a sound. No matter how good your program is, if nobody's heard about it, then it's as good as non-existent. So what do we do to communicate and market our program? Conduct lunch and learn sessions. Uh, very important and very informal uh, step to do it. We run uh, social media style discussions forums, uh, compensa uh, company wide meetups and presentations, uh, hands on workshops to train the data stewards and architects. That's the very important part that we spend a lot of time doing. Hands on, uh, train the trainer. Uh, the investment is rather large in the beginning, but the pay payback is huge. Uh, once you train uh, the architects, once this, uh, they can see the world through your eyes. Uh, you have much less headaches and much smoother process of reviewing and accepting uh, the specifications submitted from different teams. Uh, weak notification of changes, additions, updates, uh, deprecations of the APIs. Maintaining API registry, which is a repository of all API specifications. During my last year presentation, I also kind of touched up on this topic. Uh, what we do with the API registry is not just a content management system that includes the a a API specification. It also has programmatic machine readable interfaces. It exposes its own set of APIs and publishes its own events. So when there are specification added or changed, uh, different infrastructure components such as permission store, such as enterprise service bus, they can actually uh, subscribe to those notifications and uh, enable the uh, API proxy for routing. Uh, they can actually subscribe to those notifications and uh, drive their configuration based on it. Again, this is a topic for separate session. I just want to uh, in, mention that API registry is not just a uh, content-based repository. And it also, uh, the communication marketing would include the maintaining API governance portal, which includes standards, guidelines, tutorials, and metrics. Um, let me summarize the pillars of success. That's what we kind of discovery, discovered by trial and error. Um, develop domain and capability model. Very important to ensure that your APIs follow the same model. Uh, embrace API first design, uh, reduce time to market, uh, and increase the adoption rate. Maintain consistent API look and feel. Actually, this one more uh, triggers uh, increased adoption rate. Uh, employ federated API design to utilize expertise across your entire organization. So you're not limited to any particular uh, team. Uh, you're not dependent on any particular team or individual expertise uh, to develop the APIs. Establish distributed government organization. Again, you want to avoid bottlenecks. You want to uh, collect expertise. You want to make sure that the priorities are managed accordingly. And you want to make sure that uh, Everybody's participating. One of the actually main aspects of the adoption of your program is uh, using the federated design and distributed governance organization. It is much higher chance that somebody who feel who felt that they participated in defining the standards uh, would follow those standards as opposed to those standards being pushed from the top. So make sure people are involved. Make sure that nobody. Nobody opinions is overheard 
and uh, to try to take into account everybody's feedback. And last but not least, uh, conduct effective communication and marketing uh, to make sure that everything uh, you do is known to the company, is known to the teams, is known to the leadership. Because otherwise, if you don't uh, communicate, if you don't market your program, this program is good as non-existent. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, send me email, find me on the link. link. And again, thank you very much, API Days, for the opportunity to speak. Yeah, thank you so much, Boris, for the great talk on governance. And <clears throat> we have actually time for maybe one question while Gabriel's getting uh, set up and connected. So uh, you can drop any questions in the, uh, in the chat. Um, I got one for you, Boris. Uh, I'm a big fan of these, you know, internal ambassador programs. Have you seen? Uh, are there any kind of teams where that that, that seem like they, they produce better ambassadors? That if if someone's thinking of starting an ambassador program, where we should go talk to this team first? Um, well, I, I'm not sure. Uh, within the company, again, we have a large company, so there are certain teams, uh, certain ambassadors are better, certain ambassadors are worse. Certain ambassadors are more engaged, certain ambassadors less engaged. But overall, uh, as the time goes, we find that uh, the ambassadorship, ambassadorship program is very, very successful and actually creates a lot of efficiency. So uh, if you ask me for particular teams without, within my company, of course, I can say that here is my, well, it would not be actually politically correct, but say some of them are more favorite, some of the less favorite. But nevertheless, we're looking forward to everybody to become the best. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, great. And I think Gabriel is just about ready to turn camera and stuff on. I think we're out of time for questions. So uh, I see Jason, you just asked one and we'll have to catch Boris uh, in maybe networking uh, during a break. But thank you so much, Boris, for the talk on governance. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.